Hello and welcome to the first video in our series to let you know about the changes to BS7671 on wiring regulations for the UK. We'll be covering parts 1, 2 and 3. Part 1 looks at scope, object and fundamental principles. Part 2 looks at all of the definitions that will help you understand the regulations. And Part 3 which looks at assessment for general characteristics. Before we start to look at some of the changes of the regulations, it's important we understand the timescales. The regulations came out on the 1st of July 2018 and there's a six month transition period where the contractors can work to one edition of the regulations or the other. It's entirely down to them which one of those they choose to work from. But anywhere within these six months, they must be choosing to switch over to the new one. Definitely any conducted work after the 31st of December this year will be in line with the new 18th edition and will have to be in line with that document for the construction, all of the design that's done beforehand and the inspection and test. So let's start to look at some of the changes that are affecting the regulations. Now better place to start than part one. So part one looks at the scope object and fundamental principles. In here there's only one change that is happening for the contractors and that is a change that would see them need to put a personal statement if they were to invent something new or they were to move away from the regulations and not install it in a way that has been understood before. I would have to make a personal statement and attach that personal statement to the certificate but it's highly unlikely that anyone is going to do any of that. Normally, within that section of the certificate, they put the word non, and this is known as a departure from the regulations. Part two is definitions. So that looks at all the definitions that will help you understand the regulations. In here, there is going to be around 50 proposed changes. A number of them are going to come in around part eight, which is a new part that we saw around energy efficiency. Now I'll save that to later on in this topic as we start to understand really what is happening as we go through all the parts. In part two, there aren't many there that are going to cause us concern. It's just a tweak here and there to say exactly what the new understanding is as things evolve. That's pretty much all it is. Part three, which is assessment for general characteristics, I can tell you that there's absolutely nothing that is going to change what the contractors are doing technically. All the major changes we're going to see are in the other parts of the regulations. We're going to be going over part four, which covers protection and safety. This is safety against thermal effects, electric shock, over voltages and over current. There have been hundreds of changes that were proposed to this section, but I'll just be focusing on the main ones that affect the electricians day to day. One big thing is around domestic lighting circuits. Contractors may already be employing this, but the regulations are clearly saying now that these domestic lighting circuits need to be on a 30 milliamp RCD. So pretty much all circuits now will be protected on RCDs. You're going to see RCDs are mentioned a lot more in the 18th edition than they have previously. Another change is the protection to socket outlets with RCDs. At the minute, it's 20 amps or less must be protected with a 30 milliamp RCD. That's going to increase to 32 amps. So a 32 amp device all the way down must have 30 milliamp protection. Now it's important to say here there are some exemptions at the moment. The contractors can, if they want, put a label on it to say it's for a specific piece of current using equipment. Or they can do a risk assessment provided it's not in a domestic dwelling. Only the risk assessment is going to remain. The label is going to be removed from the regulations. So if a contractor does not want to give RCD protection to socket outlets at 32 amp or less, it must be a risk assessment. But you cannot do that risk assessment for domestic installations. So all domestic sockets at 32 amps or less must be on that RCD protection of 30 milliamps. Another change in part four is to do with the incoming services, be it water, gas or anything like that, when it's coming in through plastic pipes. What they are clearly saying to electricians now is there is no need to carry out any bonding at all. So you'll be finding they won't be employing a lot of green and yellow at all and definitely they'll be reducing the amount of clips that they're using. 
And something new that's coming into the regulations here are AFDDs. It's a new regulation, it's a new concept, it's a new way of thinking. The regulation recommends AFDDs can be used, however, it doesn't say that they need to be used. They're really good at protecting radio circuits from serial arcs, and they'll work on rings but only for the equipment that's plugged in. Some will take two ways, or some of them maybe even up to three ways. Also within part four, we're seeing the need to consider SPDs a lot more. SPDs, surge protection devices, at the moment are installed only if there is a compliance with what's known as an AQ criteria. This looks at the amount of thunderstorm days there are per year in different locations across the UK. Looking to try and comply with what would mean that no one would be fitting SPDs at all because the amount of lightning strikes in the whole of the UK doesn't actually meet the criteria. What they're going to say is if there is a level of consequence of an over voltage, this is either a man-made event where we see a spike in the voltage or where we're seeing a direct lightning strike. Then again, we need to consider if there's a consequence to business, health, heritage, or if it's a large number of individual dwellings put together, such as in a block of flats. We would need then to protect with SPDs. Part 5 saw one of the biggest changes recently when we looked at the Third Amendment, and this was around cables in escape routes and how we're supporting those cables. And it meant we needed to start to install a lot more metal fixings, and the problem has been that we can't really understand or agree on one definition of escape route. Now, we understand it is a route to a safe place, but other people are saying it needs to be clearly defined on a drawing when the building is first put together. And others are saying that after use and changes of directions or installation of partition walls, it could change. And that's true. So what the new regulations are talking about is that all cables must be protected against premature collapse in the event of a fire. Now, this is so that you can get out if there was a fire, or so that people can get in to get you out if there was a problem. Now, these are only fixings that will need to be there to stop the cables coming down in the early part of a fire. It's not meant to be there for hours and hours and hours, however, there is no exact time period on this. Some of the types of fixings used for this are P-clips and metal tie wraps. These would need to be fitted where it's believed cables could collapse and stop people getting out in the event of a fire, or stop people from getting in. If cables are within the fabric of the building, you won't need to go to this extreme. You can continue to use plastic clips unless it's above a suspended ceiling where metal clips would still be needed. Back now to SPDs, which are quite new to this section, and there's 17 pages worth here. Part 4 tells you whether you need them and is looking at where you must be installing them and how you must install them. There's a number of requirements here and it's all to do with that if there's that level of consequence. But it's quite intricate. How are you fitting them? Where you should be fitting them? You need to consider lighting protection zones. It's a very, very specialist area. And if anyone's really starting to think about these installations, one thing I would say is get in contact with a specialist because at the minute, 17 pages doesn't sound like a lot, but trying to get your head around all that and also the requirements from all the individual manufacturers is proving quite hard to do. Typically, there's three types of SPDs. Type 1 is to be used where there's lighting protection on the building. Type 2 has to be used at the origin also, but if you don't have lighting protection, then you won't need to use a Type 1. You can just use a Type 2. Type 3, they'll be located with more sensitive equipment, closer to your servers and data racks, or medical equipment. These devices can be integrated into consumer units or distribution boards, but only if the manufacturers have confirmed this. You must not install two different types of manufacturers into two different types of enclosures. They need to be completed as one. Moving on to part six, this looks at inspection and testing. Within this section, one of the main parts that we just touched on is that you can't mix and match and that's being included now on the inspection schedule that the electrician has to complete with every job. 
You'll have to go through and tick a number of boxes and there is one that makes sure that the manufacturer's information is clearly understood. So it really is important that when you get items to fit in the enclosure, it should only be put in that enclosure if the manufacturer of both pieces of equipment, that's the item that you're fitting and the enclosure it's going into, if they're happy for it to do so. One other thing to mention in part six is that certificates, reports and forms will be changing. So contractors will need to run down their stock of old ones in preparation for upping stock of the new ones, which were available as of the 1st of July. This gives them six months where they can run their stockpiles down in that transition period. Part seven looks at special installations and locations. Some of the big changes here are medical locations, but that is a very specialist area. So if you've got any contractors there, they'll really need to really understand what's going on with the comments of bonding and monitoring of systems. They'll really need to get their head around all the changes that are happening within section 7.10. Also, electric vehicle charging is quite a big thing at the moment. People are having more and more charging points installed and domestically some of the requirements are changing. Before, they used to say that you could not export the earth from the main house to the charging point, but domestically you're okay to do so. Well, that exemption that domestically it's okay to do so is going. So that means we're going to probably see a lot more TT systems installed because they can't take the earth from the building. They have to create their own earth where the charging point is. There is also a new section here that looks at inland navigation vessels. It's basically inland waterways, so that's charging points pretty similar to marinas. However, you'll see that the amperage of these, normally around 16 amps for marinas, is going up to about 125 amps, so they're considerably larger than what you'd expect to see. Also within part 7, anyone working in any of the sections associated with the part of the regulations will notice that there's been a tightening of IP ratings, and there are also some more requirements about where you can and can't run cables. And as we've said all throughout this video, more emphasis on how we're using our CDs. Part 8 was spoken about quite a lot recently, and it was going to be a brand new section that we've never seen in the regulations before, looking at energy efficiency. Now, we can tell you there is not going to be a Part 8. However, energy efficiency is going to be an appendix in the regulations that contractors can fill out if they want to. It looks at stuff such as monitoring a system over a 24-hour period, so equipment that will allow you to do that may be more and more used, but also looking at power factor correction units as well as voltage, optimization, and how you can control lights and circuits through smart installations. We want to thank you for joining us for our four videos covering various aspects of the changes to BS7671 on wiring regulations for the UK. Be sure to keep an eye out on cef.co.uk where all four videos will soon be available as a single download. And why not check out our great deals available online and in-store now whilst you're there.